Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Abraham Matai. I'm one of the, the chief residents of the MedBeats program. Uh, it's an honor to uh, present to you Dr. Uh, Christine Wojnowski, who will be giving us a wonderful talk uh, on a MedBeats theme, a very important topic uh, regarding cystic fibrosis. The title of the topic is Cystic Fibrosis Transitions of Care and the Impact of uh, Modulated Therapies. Um, to introduce Dr. Bojnowski, Dr. Bojnowski is currently an assistant professor of medicine and the co-director of the Adult Cystic Fibrosis Program at Tulane. Uh, she completed her Bachelor of Science in Neuroscience at Vanderbilt, after which she did her MD from George Washington University. Later on, she did a MedPeds residency at LSU in New Orleans, and uh, further went on to do a fellowship in pulmonary and critical care wherein it was both a clinical and a research-based uh, fellowship at uh, UCSD. Uh, currently, uh, she's the co-director of the Adult Cystic Fibrosis Program, and uh, she's heavily involved in uh, making a lot of changes for patients currently uh, affected by cystic fibrosis and their long-term management. Thank you, Dr. Bojanowski, for accepting this invitation. Of course, thank you so much, Abraham, and thank you for that nice introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Abraham mentioned, I will be talking to you today about cystic fibrosis, transitions of care, and the impact of modulator therapies. I have no commercial disclosures, but I am a recipient of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Program for Adult Care Excellence, the PACE Award. Before I get started, I want to give a, a little bit of a shout out to the adult CF care team. In particular, I'd like to give um, a very warm shout out to Eliza Sheffield, who is our um, social worker, our clinical social worker. She is, she and I are gonna really be joining efforts to move transitions, improving the transition program that we have here at Tulane. So our objectives for today, I will present the historical perspective of the evolving epidemiology of cystic fibrosis. We'll review the recent developments in modulator therapies. We'll discuss the impact of treatment advancements on survival in CF and patient distributions. And we'll discuss the process of and challenges to pediatric adult to adult transitions of care. So cystic fibrosis by any other name. From the mid 17th century, there were many reports of infants who most likely had cystic fibrosis just by the nature of their clinical signs and course. Across medieval Europe, these children were believed to be cursed by witches and doomed to die. The curse that eventually became folklore pronounced, woe to the child who tastes salty from a kiss on the brow, for he is cursed and soon will die. References to this uh, can be found all across uh, Europe from Poland to Spain um, to Switzerland. Just um, giving another little nod to the idea of a rose and cystic fibrosis, I did want to share with you a little story um, about the, six, the origins of the 65 roses. If you are come across the CF Foundation on, the, on media, um, on the internet, you'll often find imagery of roses and mentioning of six, the 65 roses. And I think this is a really sweet story to share. Um, Mary Weiss is a, a mother of a patient, uh, of a person who, has, who had cystic fibrosis. She was a great advocate, um, a great volunteer, really pushed efforts forward with the Cystic Found, uh, Fibrosis Foundation. And the story is, you know, she was putting all these efforts into kind of rallying efforts and tapping into resources and just really a, a, a true labor of love as, as a mother would. And she asked her son one day, she goes, do you know why mommy's working so hard? And he said, it's because of the 65 roses because he wasn't able to pronounce cystic fibrosis. So it's just a cute little side story um, that I found to be very heartwarming. So what I aim to do is walk you through the evolution of CF disease survival, discussing the notable advancements in our understanding and treatment of this disease. There have been significant improvements in CF survival since the 1930s when over 70% of sufferers died in infancy. Um, but this is still where we will start today. 
So it was in the 1930s that cystic fibrosis of the pancreas was dubbed or named by a New York pathologist, Dorothy Anderson. This was all based on her autopsy findings of 49 children who died of malnutrition or intestinal malabsorption secondary to what they thought at the time was something called celiac syndrome. Among these cases, um, she also described neonatal intestinal obstruction or meconium ileus, intestinal and other respiratory complications, including some bronchiectasis, and many other features that we now recognize to be part of the syndrome of CF, including vitamin A deficiency. In the 1940s, the median life expectancy in CF was only about 18 months. It was also during the 1940s that Sidney Farber recognized CF to be more of a generalized disorder. And he also introduced the term mucoviscidosis, which called attention to the presence of thickened mucus in patients that were affected by this disease. Anderson, um, you know, the pathologist that I just mentioned, it was also during this time that she came to report and recognize cystic fibrosis as an auto autosomal recessive disorder. It was in 1948 when there was a big New York heat wave that we actually made a big discovery. So there was a huge uh, heat wave in New York and there was an ER physician who noted excessive dehydration associated with pure salt loss. And then CF thereafter was recognized really as a defect in salt regulation. This is a paper that was published by the ER doctor that, was, that I was mentioning, Paul de Santagnez. In 1955, the research, CF-related research received national recognition. There was the establishment of the National CF Research Foundation in the US. The first research grants were awarded, uh, were awarded to doctors de Santagnez, Dr. Anderson, and Dr. Schwachman, who was someone that really introduced um, physical therapy and the idea of um, muco mucociliary clearance techniques. It was during the 19, um, 1940s, 1950s, where there were also advancements in different therapeutics, such as the introduction of pancreatic enzyme therapy, um, deficiencies in the vitamins, the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, and A, A, D, E, and K were recognized, and so uh, vitamin supplementation was initiated at this time, and as I mentioned, physical therapy and airway clearance techniques were starting to be used. Importantly as well, and based on the findings from that heat wave during that summer um, in New York in 1948, the development of the quantitative pilocarpine ionotrophoresis sweat test or the sweat chloride test was developed. And that was developed in 1959 and remains the gold standard of diagnosis of this, for this disease to this day. There's a random other side note to this. If you can imagine, these initial first tests were done by actually trying to warm an entire child. There were some adverse effects, so um, we were able to move to what we have now as the present day sweat chloride test. The 1960s, this, the median life expectancy was had reached about 10 years old. It was during this time that a network of CF centers in North America were established as well as worldwide in countries where CF was common, such as in Northern Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. In 1964, a group in Cleveland at Case Western reported a standardized treatment regimen and showed that this achieved better outcomes. So what this regimen entailed was extra nutrition, increased calorie intake, increased vitamin intake, airway clearance therapy, and the aggressive use of antibiotics. It was also during the 1960s when detailed patient registries were initiated. In the 19, it was in 1983 when Dr. Paul Quinton, a physiologist who himself has CF, discovered that the basic defect in the CF sweat duct was due to a chloride impermeability. He is currently a professor of pediatrics at, U at UCSD where I train, so I, I was very fortunate and have been fortunate to get to know him personally. There are a lot of other advancements during this time in the 1980s, such as the use of the blood immunoreactive trypsin test for neonatal CF screening. Um, intensive courses of IV antibiotics became routine, routine treatment for exacerbations 
new anti-pseudomonal antibiotics became available. Tunneled IV catheters were also now being used for people that had recurrent need. And then major, another major advance during this time period for those who had reached the end stages of their lung disease was the advent of heart lung transplant in 1985. So this is what we're seeing here with this uh, you know, dramatic increase in median survival. It was in 1989 um, when the discovery of the CF gene was actually made and the CF gene was named and the protein was named. So the protein, um, uh, the protein, there were the responsible gene and protein for this disease was identified um, as the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, the CFTR gene. It was during this time that, you know, this was localized to chromosome setup seven, the genetic code was sequenced. And here is the front page cover of Science Magazine in 1989. And here is the same young man in 2007, and he is taken. He is in this picture with Francis Collins, who's the director of NIH and also is one of the lead investigators of the Human Genome Project. So, really, overall, with each new decade, new therapies have been introduced, leading to dramatic increases in survival. There have been continued advancements in research, um, the development of the treatment mainstays, and, it, and advancements in lung transplantation as well. The blip here that may have caught your eye is actually false. Um, this was during a period of time where they were changing the uh, modality and the, the way that we were collecting registry information. So while most of what I reviewed during that timeline is the GI manifestations of the disease, today really the major cause of morbidity and mortality in patients with cystic fibrosis is lung disease and chronic lung infection. As with other sources of bronchiectasis and certainly cystic fibrosis, we describe um, what is known to be kind of a vicious cycle of disease and of infection leading to more inflammation, leading into more obstruction, but then goes back into infection, just repeating the cycle leading to worsening lung function more, uh, and progressive decline. So, you know, as I mentioned before, we have done a lot of work over the past several decades um, to attack and, uh, and come up with treatment modalities to attack each area of this vicious cycle. Just, uh, just to not leave a big question mark, ASL uh, stands for airway surface liquid. So again, the take home point from this slide is that I'm not gonna get into the details of many of these things, but we have a truly comprehensive and complex treatment regimen um, um, in place to approach each of these different targets. Now, I just want to take a minute to review the burden of this disease, the daily burden of this disease. And I like this e-card, the SUM e-card. I thought this was really funny during um, the CF awareness. I'm done with my morning treatments. I'm free. Just kidding. I have to get ready for the next one. So this is, I'm just going to review with you the, what, our, what we ask our patients to do on a daily routine just to stay well and just to maintain where they're at. So we ask them to do airway clearance, a minimum of one hour a day. So 30 minutes of best or exercise um, for one hour a day. We ask them to do inhaled medications. These can include Dornizalpha or Palmazyme, hypertonics, inhaled antibiotics. There's a very heavy amount of oral medications that are needed, that are needed daily. Time required total when well is three to five hours, which is just so incredible to me. You add on the complication of cystic fibrosis related diabetes, that adds on another hour on top of that. And if someone's sick, acutely decompensated in an exacerbation and they need IV therapies, their treatment uh, time that needs to be dedicated on a daily basis is, can be upwards and greater than eight hours per day. So going back to these mainstays of treatment, and I said I wasn't going to focus on too many of them, but you know, as is an objective, as it is an objective of this talk, we are going to spend some time talking about CFTR modulators. And CFTR modulator therapies have really been the major development of this past decade. 
So before we get into modulators, we do need to review some of the basics of the CFTR protein. So the CFTR gene encodes a, a CAMP-regulated chloride channel known as CFTR. It's expressed on the apical surface of epithelial cells. These are found in lung, pancreas, sweat glands, intestines, testes, liver, also the bone. And I put this kind of a little bit more complex um, uh, cartoon here just to show that CFTR, while we are really just talking, while we, we focus on this chloride channel, there is a lot of interplay with other channels that, are, that exist on the epithelial surface, um, notably uh, chloride and bicarbonate channel. So CFTR mutations, to date, there are there have been there are greater than 2500 mutations that have been identified within CFTR as many of us may remember from medical school and as i may have mentioned before this is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder so that means you have to get inherit one copy of a diseased um, a mutation or a disease causing mutation from each of your parents the mutations that are present um, and that have been identified in CFTR um, you know, really do vary in terms of their impact on phenotype. So there are six different classes of mutations that have been identified or described to date, and I'm gonna focus on two of them. The first one is the class two um, mutations, which lead to defective processing. I mentioned this because Delta F508, which is something that you may remember from way back in, in medical school, um, it, this is an example of a class two uh, mutation. It is also the most common type of mutation that we that is associated with disease and cystic fibrosis. With this mutation, the protein has it, it does, is not formed in the right 3D shape. So it ends up getting stuck in the endoplasmic reticulum and through that packaging and delivery process through to get to the apical surface of the cell. The other class I want to mention is class three. And class three is over here. Um, and that is defective, that results in defective regulation of the chloride channel. G551D is a classic or is the most recognized um, mutation within this, within this class of, mu of, of mutations. These classes of mutations only make up of maybe 5% of the total amount of disease causing mutations in CF. Um, and I highlight this one as well because it'll come into play when we talk about modulators because the first drug that was developed, the first modulator drug actually targeted class three uh, mutations. So again, I've talked about CFTR modulator therapies being the biggest advancement in the past decade. What, is, what are CFT, CFTR modulators? They're really, um, you, can, you can view them as being correctors or potentiators. They either correct the 3D shape of the protein, making sure that it gets to where it needs to go, um, and potentiators, meaning that it, it enhances the effective transport of chloride once it's at the ap apical surface. So first in 2012, um, FDA approved Ivacaftor, also called Kaleidoco. This um, is a, is a, uh, a modulator therapy that is approved for the class three mutations. So as I mentioned, G551D, um, it, these are the mutations that impact regulation of chloride. And unfortunately, while the benefits to this drug were significant, um, it really was only applicable to 5% uh, of our total patients. In 2015, the FDA approved Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor, or Cambi. This drug um, was, is a combination of both a corrector, Lumacaftor, and a potentiator, Ivacaftor. They published this and approved this for individuals with cystic fibrosis that were homozygous for the Delta F508. Unfortunately, those that are homozygous from, with Delta F508 so only comprises about 45% of the total patient population. Now this drug was good. The impacts and the benefits were slightly less than what we saw for those patients that were able to take Kaleidoco. 
Um, but there was also the introduction of more adverse events, sometimes people having um, significant issues with GI tolerance. There are also some cases where people had worsening, um, like a paradoxical reaction um, in terms of the, their pulmonary function. Shortly thereafter, in 2018, FDA approved Tezacaftor, a different corrector, and Ivacaftor, the potentiator, um, and this was called Simdeco. This had a much better uh, safety profile and tolerability for patients. And they also were able to expand this to not just the homozygous Delta F508 uh, mutation carriers, but um, they were able to expand it to some other individuals that had this residual function as their secondary allele. Lastly, in 2019, the FDA approved Alexacaftor, uh, which is a new generation modulator therapy or corrector, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, it's called Trikafta. Now this was the biggest, uh, you know, this was a huge deal. Um, and because this drug is approved for and was studied and is approved for people with just a single Delta F508 mutation, the eligibility in patients greatly expanded. And so now 90% of people with cystic fibrosis are able to uh, benefit from this drug. So do they work? All of these studies showed kind of some variation um, between their endpoints, but the general um, endpoints that were looked at in each of these uh, trials were improvements in lung function reported as percent predicted FEV1, decreased rates of pulmonary exacerbations, improved sweat chloride concentration, improved CFQR respiratory domain scores, which I'll mention briefly later, increased BMI, and then also, of course, taking into account safety and side effect profiles. So again, you don't need to be a cystic fibrosis doctor or a pulmonologist who have probably caught wind um, of this FDA approval, which happened in October, November of 2019. So this is a New England Journal article that was published in November of 2019. It reports the findings of a randomized placebo-controlled trial that enrolled over 400 patients over the age of 12 who were heterozygous for Delta F508 um, and had a second variant that produced no or little uh, CFTR protein. So these are the primary endpoints, and I'll walk you through those quite quickly. They're, they're pretty impressive. So the, the primary endpoint was looking at the absolute change in FEV1 at week four. And what they showed at week four, which also persisted to week, week four, which also persisted to week 20, 24 with some improvement, is that the percent predicted FEV1 increased by 13.8 points. And this increase to 14.3 and was a sustained effect. When we look at this um, through a subgroup analysis, making sure that there wasn't any variability when you took into account the background of the patient in terms of age, sex, their location, what their baseline FEV1 may have been, what their background therapies included, um, did they have pseudomonas, for example, um, was included on their analysis as well. And what they found was a consistent mean treatment difference across all of the pre-specified subgroups, which is pretty remarkable. And they found that this was held up uh, down to patients with FEV1 of 40% predicted at their baseline. Key secondary endpoints, um, the first to discuss is the number of pulmonary exacerbations. So the rate of pulmonary exacerbations was 63% lower in patients that were on the study drug versus placebo. There were similar benefits when looking at pulmonary exacerbations leading to hospitalization, as well as pulmonary exacerbations needing to be treated at all with IV antibiotics at home or otherwise. This graph here also shows that there was a delayed time to first pulmonary exacerbation after starting the study drug. The investigators also looked at absolute change in sweat chloride concentration. This is looking at the mean treatment difference at 24 weeks, and what they found was a decrease in sweat chloride by 41.8 um, millimoles per liter. And this brought many of the uh, participants in this trial down to normal levels um, for, or the normal range for sweat chlorides. 
They also report an absolute change in CFQR respiratory domain score. So CFQR is a standardized and validated um, score that reflects patient reported quality of life with regard to respiratory symptoms. And what they, so a higher score is better. And what they found on this drug is that overall, these patients report had a 20.2, um, a 20.2 point higher score on their CFQR while on the study drug, and this was maintained throughout the whole uh, treatment period. And lastly, they looked at the absolute change over time from baseline uh, body mass index. I think probably just going through the timeline and our under and understanding of this disease, I think everyone can appreciate the malnutrition and the new nutrition and GI aspects of this disease are considerable. And so weight gain and weight maintenance can be um, often a challenge for our patients. What they found on, uh, what they found uh, in this trial that uh, Trikafta also positively impacted body mass index. The mean treatment difference was found to be one uh, relative uh, to placebo, meaning it was one point higher. So, Another point to make about uh, Trikafta is that all the patients that were enrolled in the study were, were essentially able to complete it. The drug was very well tolerated. There were no deaths in any of the trial groups and adverse effects. Interestingly enough, there was a slightly higher report of adverse effects in the placebo group as compared to those getting the treatment drug. So looking at the trends in CFTR modulator use uh, per year, Blue is looking at, um, this is from 2015 to 2019. Blue is looking at, uh, is representing individuals that are not eligible um, by age or by genotype. So these people were not able to receive or qualify for any of the modulator therapies that were available. Yellow was eligible but not prescribed for whatever the reason may be. Purple is, or can be, and really I should go from the bottom. So Ivacaptor, which was the first one that was introduced, um, has stayed uh, with, good, with good response, has stayed um, you know, a, a mainstay for several of our patients with CF. This is the trends in use of Orcambi, which decreased over time with the introduction of some Deco, which tended to be uh, better tolerated. And then lastly, we have Alexacaftor. And I highlight this and want to highlight, uh, mention the fact that, again, this drug was FDA, gained FDA approval in October, November of 2019. So this is, um, you know, it really made its statement, um, oops, excuse me, um, you know, its presence known. Um, before the end of the calendar year, about 6,000 patients were on this drug. So, Overall, modulated therapy has dramatically improved the quality and longevity of life with, in, of patients with CF. Instantly and definitely over this past year, we've, are, we've seen dramatic decreases in hospitalizations, days in hospitals when they are admitted, and the decreased need for home IV antibiotics. The exact extent and the impact that it'll have on lifespan has yet to be determined, and we're all really excited about that. Um, as I've mentioned a few times now, Again, 90% of patients with CF have eligible genetics for this drug. This drug is now approved down to the age of six years old and above. And I do just wanna make a comment about the fact that this drug is of particularly high cost, unfortunately. Um, so the, the cost, the drug does cost about $300,000 per year. Um, we also recognize that in addition to the high cost, we anticipate a need for lifetime use. So this is well above where we would set an appropriate health benefit price um, for any interventions, um, which is more likely in the 60s to $80,000 uh, uh, range per year. So again, I just wanted to reemphasize that this really has been the biggest advancements, uh, advancement since the discovery of the gene in 1989. Um, this is not the first email or the last email or, the, or anywhere in between for the discussions that I've had with patients since starting this drug, but this one um, was one of my favorites. 
So this, I have permis permission from my patient to post this picture of her, um, but she got home that night, opened up her, her mail, received her, her trikafta, took a selfie at 1245, emailed me at 1248. And, you know, I've kind of, taken out a couple of excerpts of the email, but the one thing I want to emphasize is how she just said, I hope to have a long life now. I hope to have a long life and keep you as my doctor for a long time. I didn't read that part, but I hope to have a long life. Um, and this has just been one, just an overwhelming emotional response um, that has come, uh, that has been shared with us by many of our patients. So, you know, patients are now thinking more about their general life milestones that many of us take for granted, pursuing higher education, um, getting married, uh, in, engaging in meaningful employment, and then even looking towards retirement now. And so I think that's been more of uh, one of the more common jokes is I'm gonna have to start investing in retirement, which is a great joke to have, um, you know, given the history. So going back again to life expectancy and looking at median survival, this is at five-year increments over the past 20 years. And where we are today is, uh, as of 2019, the median survival for patients with CF is now 46 years. Really, what we predict from the just this past five-year period is that more than 50% of babies that are born with CF um, or people that are age 30 or older during this time period will reach at least their fifth decade of life. So cystic fibrosis is recognized as being the most common inheritable uh, genetic, you know, inheritable disease that affects Caucasians uh, largely. There are 30,000 people in the US that are impacted by this disease or have this disease, more than 70,000% worldwide about what this translates to is about one in 30, depending on the source, one in 30 Caucasians are heterozygote carriers and they likely on the order of tens of millions do not know that they are carriers. So this is a, just a map from 2019 with the cases of cystic fibrosis by state, emphasizing here our beloved Louisiana and uh, the patients living with CF uh, in, our, in our home state. As an adult provider, um, this is one of my favorite uh, graphs that they put out every year with the CF Foundation and Patient Registry. It's showing the percentage of adults over the age of 18 in blue um, as compared to children under the age of 18 with CF. And what we've seen over time and where we are today is that there are more adults living with CF than there are children. So this really has shifted to being an adult disease. So here again is our, our young gentleman featured here on 1989 when they discovered the gene. This is 20 years later. Um, you know, CF really is a model of how a pediatric disease has and has is able to become an adult disease. Um, this is largely in part due to our better, well, this is due to our better understanding of the disease the improvements that we're constantly making in available therapies and the overall better organization of care that we're able to provide. So the CF Foundation is a large, well-resourced nonprofit organization that supports not only CF research and advocacy, but also clinical care. It was established in 1955. Um, and this, this picture is a little bit uh, outdated but hits the mark pretty closely. And this is showing a distribution of uh, CF Foundation accredited, dedicated uh, CF care centers. So to date, there are about 130 care centers in the US. Um, about 100 of these provide adult care. Again, in the circle here is our, our program here at Tulane. Our program here at Tulane, we have both pediatric and adult arms, our pediatric side. Um, it has about 140 patients and our adult size has about 100. So just to touch on the evolution of transition programs and adult care um, in the CF model, um, it was really in the 1990s when patients were having, um, were surviving into adulthood um, that adult CF programs were introduced. 
Currently, the SIA Foundation mandates that adult programs be established and accredited when any CF center population includes greater than 40 adults older than the age of 18. What this has led to is essentially a model of one center, one overarching CF center with two programs, the pediatric and the adult program like we have here at Tulane. Um, in 2000, the CF Foundation mandated that for each pediatric program, 90% of patients past their 21st birthday will be transferred or should be transferred by that time to an adult program. So really the CF Foundation has been working hard to prioritize this transition um, and focus efforts to doing that and trying to do it in a way that is most successful. So while our pediatric colleagues and Dr. Klingsberg and I are all CF physicians, the diseases that we manage in our inpatient outpatient settings between pediatric and adult um, are quite different as, as can our approaches be quite different as well. So for example, you know, in the adult population, we co-manage more asthma, acid reflux, CF-related diabetes, and sinus disease. And as always, with increasing survival, we're introduced uh, to new challenges. So of course, being the main driver of morbidity and mortality in these patients, uh, you know, more complex managing of worsening lung function over time. We have, um, you know, while pediatrics can really focus on and have a lot of power to focus on um, chronic infection prevention, on the adult side, we are focused more on the complicated management of chronic infections with oftentimes uh, multi-drug resistant bacteria. With that going hand in hand is the concern and um, successful management and prevention of cross infection between patients. We also have to address issues with bone health now. Um, and this is related to chronic issues with vitamin malabsorption as well as the presence of CFTR on, the, on bone um, surface as well. We are dealing more with the questions of fertility and pregnancy, depression, anxiety, renal disease that's largely iatrogenic over years of giving of having to take very serious and nephrotoxic drugs. We are dealing with cancer and colon cancer in our adult patients. And we're also learning how to balance family support when the patient needs to uh, receive like intensive medical treatments. So um, the clinical management approach from looking at it as a psychosocial process on pediatrics when we're in the clinic, they tend to be, our approach tends to be much more family oriented. You rely significantly on parents and their involvement in decision making. It's generally described and felt to be a more nurturing environment um, and tends to uphold more of a prescriptive, prescriptive atmosphere. Now this changes quite a bit on the adult side. We really try to focus on the individual, making the treatment very patient specific. And what that means is that we also enlist the patient and require of them to have a certain degree of autonomy. Um, and we incorporate the independent skills of the patients into our treatment plans. The patient is expected to make decisions to collaborate with treatment providers, and generally, outside of CF, I would say there are not many interdisciplinary source resources for adult clinics. So adolescence in general um, is just something worth talking about. It is a time of great change with shifts occurring in emotional attachments, relationships, um, sense of autonomy, self-identity, making one's own life philosophy. If you're having changes in sexuality, there are physical growth changes, changes in your physical shape, and also changes in your cognitive development. So those, for those who have a chronic illness, this developmental stage can be complicated further by the extra responsibility of having to take care of oneself and, their, and your own health. And then there also may be a lot of extra emotional stress related to facing one's own morbidity, mortality, and limitations to your life options. So talking more now about healthcare transition medicine. So stated by the Society for Adult Adolescent Medicine, healthcare transition medicine is the purposeful planned movement of adolescents and young adults with chronic physical and medical conditions from child-centered to adult-oriented healthcare systems. Seems pretty straightforward. Um, it is a very important component of high-quality healthcare. 
and it requires active participation by both pediatricians and internists. These transitions are often difficult, creating potential gaps in care, which lead to adverse outcomes, health ag outcomes, and feelings of frustration. And our role as a provider is to really mitigate the negative impact that that changing clinical model from pediatric to adult, um, the mitigating the impact that that change may have on adherence. So looking at general healthcare transition needs in our country, in the US, um, 18% of adolescents under the age of 18 have a special health care need, and that's defined as uh, someone that is at increased risk for chronic physical, developmental behavior or emotional conditions. Today, 90% uh, of children with special health care needs survive into adulthood. So what that translates into is 500,000 youth with special health care needs are reaching their 18th birthday each year in the US and should be transitioning to an adult care system. So this is not just something that we think about in cystic fibrosis. The focus on healthcare transition has a lot of applicability to many other diseases. To highlight just a few, sickle cell anemia, asthma, diabetes, congenital heart disease, also HIV, autism, we have childhood cancer survivors, survivors and transplant recipients. So the advantages of a disease specific model, such as making a transition clinic in CF, you have a common condition with a more homogenous experience. There's a common set of needs generally. There's a consistent pediatric care team that knows the patients very well. There is an identified uh, receiver on the other end of the transition in the adult providers. And you have um, handing over of care that can often be done in the setting of joint clinics or on open house days. So the CF uh, Foundation has some recommendations. Um, regarding successful transitions. Although several different models have been proposed well-timed transitions are generally recommended to occur between the ages of 18 and 21 years old. The concept of transition should be introduced early. Adolescents should gradually be given more responsibility for self-care and decision-making, health education and training, and should be seen alone during some of these clinic visits, um, even on the pediatric side. Formal transfer of care typically coincides with graduation from high school, but should be individualized to patients. And strategies that can promote smooth transition to, a, to adult care clinics include a thorough understanding of the patient prior to transfer that's achieved through effective communication between pediatric and adult healthcare teams, inviting parents to the first visit in adult care, introducing any changes in medical treatment gradually, and oftentimes a designated coordinator can help to smooth this transition process. In parallel with the CF Foundation and their recommendations as we're working to build a better transition network, um, there was a consensus statement that was released in 2011. It was um, published and promoted and endorsed by several of the major leading uh, primary care organizations such as the AAP, the AAFP, and the ACP. This consensus statement uh, endorses the importance of facilitating the transition of adult adolescents with special health care needs into adulthood and provides a framework for this. They proposed a structured clinical approach that has six core elements, which I'll go over with you. And out of this consensus statement uh, was birthed GOT Transition, which is a federally funded national resource center on healthcare transitions. So this is just an overview of the six core elements. So starting from the age of 12 and taking um, patients to 18 to 21 when they actually get transferred. Um, the first part, and I'll focus here, this is on the uh, pediatric arm of this, uh, of this transition and on the adult arm. So from ages 12 to 14, you start talking with the patients and their families about what it means to transition, what to expect, um, you know, setting up expectations for when they will transition as well. Ages 14 to 18, you're tracking their progress. Both the pediatric and adult size are looping back in with each other to uh, discuss uh, transition readiness, um, transition preparation, 
uh, what our timelines are looking like. Right? Continuing on through ages 14 through 18, we're assessing skills of the individual patient as well. Um, you know, we're conducting transition readiness assessments, more so on the pediatric side, but from the adult side, we welcome, you know, question answer sessions with the patients and their parents if it's needed at all. The, step, the fourth step is developing, uh, developing or the development of um, the transition plan, a formal transition plan, um, including putting together a formal medical summary. And then finally, in step five, we have a transfer to adult centered, uh, to a, a transfer to adult centered care and integration to the adult practice. So when they come to adult, to adult um, clinics, we should be reviewing their transfer package. Um, we should be addressing their needs and concerns at the initial visit. We should be doing an updated self-care assessment uh, and reviewing their medical summary. And then the final last step is actually like closing the loop. And so the sixth element is to confirm transfer completion and elicit consumer feedback, meaning um, getting feedback from both the uh, patient and also from our pediatric colleagues. This can be condensed to a three-phase approach very quickly. You're really focusing on readiness, and that really involves clear, safe communication. You start this communication early. You have uh, the incorporation of developmentally appropriate participation in self-care, meaning that young children should start mixing their aerosols or start managing their pancreatic enzyme use, for example. There's the handoff, so the, this really is just the coordinated collaboration between current the current pediatrician and the future adult care provider, um, the presence of an establishment of combined clinics if possible. And then lastly is the successful transfer, and a successful transfer is achieved when there are no surprises for the patient or the new physician. So ideal transitions really are coordinated, multifaceted, patient and family-centered, provide flexibility to meet individual and family needs, address common concerns of patients and parents, gradual, and they also promote autonomy. So this is meant to be overwhelming. Um, most of the data that we have on the success of transitions is are collected through mixed methods, so combinations of surveys and uh, interviews. So this is just reflecting that attitudes and perceptions, which are maybe one of the easiest things to study through the through these mixed methods um, are incredibly critical in successful transition from pediatrics to adults. So attitudes really play a big deal and a, a, a big role here. Um, what I'm showing here is just this generated list of all the things that are sources for concern um, and fear when people are, uh, as a provider or as a patient, transitioning someone to a, from a pediatric to an adult center. Another thing to note, and some things that have come out of this research is that if the individual philosophies of team members differ, mixed messages and projected anxiety really hinders successful transition to adult care. There um, exists a significant amount of concern among, among pediatric providers and parents as well about the ability of the adult staff to provide the similar level of care that's provided in the pediatric realm. And there's also a big loss on both sides of the patient and of the pediatrician um, over the, there's concern about losing a very long-standing and strong relationship between the physician and the, and the patient. So assessing outcomes of CF transition. So despite the importance of healthcare transitions that we've identified and discussed, little is known about the actual factors that can yield a successful transition to adult care. Many of the recommendations come out of clinical experience rather than by validated evidence. There really is a relative dearth in, in just lack of transition-related validated assessment tools available. Most published literature, as I've mentioned before, tends to be descriptive, so looking really at qualitative outcomes such as satisfaction and perceptions, both from providers and treatment, uh, the treatment team as well as the patients and family members. Ideally, measurements that we would have on hand would be numbers, looking at improvement in adherence to care, followed by improved perceived health status, quality of life, self-care skills, increased adult visit attendance, 
less time between last pediatric visit and initial adult visit, and decreased hospitalizations. So really our next steps are to bring the focus to quality improvement and to generate some of this outcomes research so that we're able to, in, to develop appropriate transition policies and programs. Um, along with that, it would be wonderful to, and as a natural follow-up step, would be to standardize approaches that, uh, that support these transitions. And eventually, and really now, we should be incorporating the concepts and challenges of transitions of care into didactic curriculums of training programs, both at the medical school and at the resident level. So our key take home points, with each decade, new therapies have been introduced leading to dramatic increase in survival for patients living with CF. Modulator therapy is changing the landscape of CF management and outcomes. We have not fully been, we are waiting with anxious breath to see um, the impact of modulator therapies, um, especially in terms of uh, longevity and the amount of transplants that are needed. CF is now truly an adult chronic disease. Other key take home points are, are that a successful patient and family centered healthcare transition process is critical to preserve the achievements made in chronic disease management. Healthcare transitions are multifaceted and complex. Empirical research is really needed to guide comprehensive evidence based approach to the process. And CF is poised to become a model for the successful transition of care with chronic, uh, for those with chronic health conditions and special health care needs. All right, we've left a few minutes. I kind of hustled through in case there were any questions. If there is anything that comes up at a separate time, of course, feel free to email me. Abraham. Hey, um, uh, the Q&A box is available for you all to either enter in the questions or you can unmute your microphones. I think we can leave it for a minute or two. <laughs> Dr. Bozhnevsky, I've got a question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. particularly from the MedPeds perspective. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to uh, the different symptoms, particularly with the immunomodulator therapies, um, are they more effective in treating certain symptoms compared to the others? Like for example, pulmonary more than gastrointestinal? So for the modulator therapy uh, in particular, I think the most dramatic is going to be the pulmonary effects, you know, and that were really the main uh, primary and secondary endpoints that we were looking at. Um, I think that, um, you know, it, it's very interesting. I think especially with Trikafta, what patients have described, they've been living with a chronic wet cough for their entire life. And after starting modulator therapy, um, many patients have described a purge where, you know, within a week of starting treatment, they have this huge, you know, efflux and um, expectoration of all of this thick, gunky sputum, and then a complete dry up and resolution of cough. Now, that's a little bit of an extreme picture, but people are talking about just that being one of the, the biggest impact, impacting their quality of sleep at night, their ability to spend time with other people, um, you know, because it, it, they're not embarrassed about coughing, that they don't feel like their, their uh, pulmonary symptoms are so disruptive to the people that are around them. People are also having much better exercise tolerance, um, you know. And I think one of the other, you know, and I think one of the other main, um, you know, effects that we're seeing, which was mentioned um, and reported from the Trikafta study, is that we are having a lot of um, like improvements in nutritional status, and so. People are really like dealing with buying clothes for the new first time in, in decades of life because um, they're gaining weight on these drugs. And so I think with that, and that also plays back into general pulmonary and lung health. I mean, you have better body mass to support your muscles of respiration 
Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think those are the, the big things people talk about the pulmonary symptoms, weight gain, better sleep, um, and better energy. I mean, those are the, those are the big ones. Um, I saw that, uh, Victor, Victor Ramirez had a question on, are there any projects that we as residents can participate in regardless of program affiliation? med peds, peds or internal medicine are there opportunities to join projects at this moment that is a great question i think that there is a always an opportunity to get more involved in projects quality improvement and research projects certainly we have um, a pretty robust uh research program coming out of our cf um our CF Center. We have a lot of quality improvement um, initiatives that are going on that I would love to have residents or trainees get more involved in. Um, if one of my med peds peeps wants to kind of play a more active role in the establishment of a formal transition program and process here, I would welcome that absolutely. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Hopefully that does. I'm gonna take it as a, a biased question that you wanna get more involved with CF. <laughs> um, and, uh, okay, great, he said it does. Um, and I got a question from uh, Sonia Malhotra. Hello, Sonia Malhotra. Um, thank you for your question. So from a symptoms perspective, what have you found most helpful when treating dyspnea? other than treating the underlying disease. That is a great, um, that is a really great, great question. And I actually will tell you that I will flip that back to you as my counterpart. So when we're really getting to those advanced stages of lung disease, I find, especially in any chronic disease, and ideally it would be earlier, I love to incorporate the help of palliative care. Um, and so I do not have it in my practice generally to prescribe opioids um, for dyspnea. I know that is done in advanced uh, lung disease, certainly done in advanced obstructive lung disease. I just have not needed to do that on my end. Um, uh, I do love, again, just the idea of incorporating a palliative health care team, um, especially just for moral support and just understanding um, you know, just the, where you are in, a, in the course of a lifetime with a very chronic disease. Awesome, and she shares with everyone that um, at, at Pittsburgh, they did a lot of opioids and benzos in CF patients and also use a different combination of inhalers, which is really helpful, thank you. Dr. Bojanowski, one question was about CRISPR. Uh, where does it stand? Oh, gosh. So there, that is a whole nother little realm, and that's kind of like the final frontier. Um, you know, the last, there are 10% of patients with um, cystic fibrosis that are not candidates for um, gene modulator, or excuse me, protein modulator therapy. And so gene, um, you know, gene therapy is is now the, next area of focus. Well, that brings us to the end of our uh, allotted time. I want to thank you uh, for this uh, uh, wonderful presentation. It was really very interesting and informative. I want to also thank uh, all who joined in online uh, and thank Dr. Abraham and uh, have a uh, safe and great afternoon, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.